Welcome to the Data Leadership Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algman. Data is everywhere in our businesses, and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. Today, we welcome Peter Aiken. Peter is an acknowledged data management authority, an associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, past president of DAMA International, and associate director of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers. Among his 12 books are the first on chief data officers, the first describing the monetization of data for profit and good, and the first on modern strategic data thinking. His latest venture is anything awesome. Peter, welcome to the show. I am so excited to have you here today. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate the opportunity and the honor to, to be um, asked for my opinion on some things. So, and, and you know, and, on a personal note, before we like dive into the content of the episode, uh, Peter has been, you know, literally one of my heroes in the uh, data management, data governance community, uh, the work he's done with DEMA, the, you know, just seeing his presence for, you know, the decade plus that I've been involved with it. Um, you know, he's been a, a true leader in that community. And we have a lot to thank Peter for. So as as a representative of the people that are, you know, riding your coattails and trying to um, you know, move the needle in in the data management community. You know, you have been somebody that a lot of us look up to, and as humble as you are, um, you should know that that is something that is as meaningful to me and and a lot of folks out there. So, thank you from that perspective. And I'm excited to talk to you today. So, Again, why don't thank you for the kind words? Yeah, it's, it's interesting if you think about our profession in context of the software engineering profession. Think about the excitement that's generated around agile, which is the best proven method. For achieving faster software development, why can't we get that going in the data world? Right, it's it's equally as as productive, if not uh, perhaps even more so. And and that's one of the reasons why I've always kind of related to your take on a lot of this, um, because you have that technology background, you understand how machines and systems work, and I think that that connection is so important to truly understanding data. And and we'll we'll get into some of that uh, in our conversation. But I, I did a very quick drive by on your on your bio. Uh, we have your slide. Uh, for those of you who are watching, we have um, you know some additional information on Peter on the screen. Um, but I would like to ask you, you know, how did you come to do this work? And and can you give us a little bit more background of how did Peter Aiken become the Peter Aiken with 12 books and uh, and teaching in this space and doing some things that nobody else has really done because of the focus in this whole data community. Uh, you mentioned the word mentoring, Anthony, and I'm, I'm flattered that you think of it that way. It's, it's really a really collegial relationship, but I also had some fantastic mentors in the process. And one of the things they taught me was that data are the most practical and fundamental type of requirements in any type of a system. And that in and of itself makes them worth studying more so than perhaps functional requirements uh, when you look at them, because the data set, once, of course, it's created, it remains uh, unchanged and the software gets wrapped around it, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. But but let's take a step backwards, because I do think it's interesting to, to see the origins of these things. And I, I got here probably like you did by by kind of accident. Um, I'm pretty sure you, you uh, uh, didn't wake up at age 18 or whatever year we're supposed to be of a majority and say, ah, I'm going to go out and become a data thought leader around this this type of thing, did you, Anthony? Uh, not at all. And I actually woke up one day and I was like, huh, I've done all this stuff and I am surprised I'm here now. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, we don't, some of not all the stuff we do is perfect and we make mistakes along the way. And absolutely. So let's just take this though back to where our profession, the, the one we share, uh, started. And I count it as less than 200 years old if we think about it uh the countess of loveless here uh looked at this device that was a weaving loom although she looked at that device and then also looked at the industrial version of it which existed as well uh those things on the the right hand side of that that orangey photograph there are um really the um punch card equivalents telling the loom at an industrial scale what type of weave to do at each point and she mm -hmm equated that in her mind to the punch card, uh, which was also uh, becoming of age at that point, doing things like counting sensei and things like that, uh, and, and created in her mind a machine 
that would do computations. This is a Bernoulli engine equation that she drew for machine implementation. She is literally the world's first programmer. Mm. Uh, and, and just to give her full due, she also is the inventor of something that Gartner calls the hype cycle. And, and she said it very succinctly in her writings. In considering anything new, there's frequently a tendency to overrate what we find already interesting or remarkable, and then by a, a natural reaction to undervalue the case. In other words, we love it, we hate it, and the answer is somewhere in between. And, and all that relates to me to say that less than 200 years later, I started working for a group called the Defense Information Systems Agency. And they gave me a great title. I was the U.S. Department of Defense Reverse Engineering Program Manager. Boy, that's a mouthful, right? And my boss says to me, your first project is to keep me from testifying to a congressional committee. Now, Anthony, if I'm testifying to Congress, who is always sitting at my right-hand side? A lawyer? You got it exactly right. And I'm thinking, man, did I make a bad career decision to start serving the Defense Department at this point in time? Um, Bell, my, my boss and, and current friend, uh, said, no, actually, it's a little simpler problem than that. The problem, Peter, is that we've got 37 systems that pay people within the DOD. They grew up uh, by good people creating something that they saw as a need, but nobody coordinated the group of these systems jumping up. And of course, how many do we need within DOD? Well, that's that's answer is one. Yeah. How many potential losers then becomes a matter of either 36 or 37, depending on whether you, Peter, uh, choose one of the existing systems or choose to create a new one. Hmm. Now, the, the real question goes to the, the question of management. So the Pentagon would ask a question of the 37 systems, how many employees do you have? And the various 37 systems would reply with what sounded like an insubordinate response, what do you mean by an employee? Yeah. Yeah. So the problem was in DOD at the time, about 30% of the workforce um, had a second job within DOD. So the definition of employee could be one, one and a half or two employees, depending on how you chose to cut it. And the people who were responding were smart enough to know that that made a difference. Because if you're going to tell somebody that the number is too big or too small, then they need to know whether that number is accurate, right? Mm. Uh, anyway, what do you mean by an employee was a, a very common rephrase. And so DOD lacking standardization in those days, didn't have the ability to do this. And so process modeling gave us very inconclusive results. And we, in fact, invented a technique with a, a couple of colleagues uh, inside the Department of Defense, this technique called data reverse engineering. So if a, a klutz like me can invent something in the early 90s that is literally something that didn't exist before the, the invention of this, our profession is new and evolving. And the, the part that was interesting about this was in DOD, it was clear that lack of governance was preventing management from occurring because if you couldn't get beyond the question, what is an employee? How else is anything going to be there? It's not a technical problem yet. Um, they would have a component, a role to play, but uh, the, the sequencing is, is really crucial around that. And an objective selection was made. We found a system that had a specific requirement for a waist deep, uh, excuse me, an engineer working under waist deep water uh, underneath rotating helicopter blades on overtime. And if that system didn't have that type of data tracking capabilities in it, it didn't meet the full set of requirements and we could eliminate it from further consideration. Uh, in, in other words, nobody got mad at us. And that was mm. very, very interesting. Uh, again, long story short, they then ordered me to write a book. <laughs> and I said, can you order me to write a book? And they said, you want to ask that question twice? And I correctly shut my mouth and <laughs> got to writing. So, the field of data reverse engineering was born with a publication. Yeah. It's a, a wonderful honor to have the four million best-selling book in Amazon's catalog there. I just think that's a, a, a wonderful opportunity to, to do this. And yes, we land here by strange, strange routes, don't we? Yeah. And one of the things we need to do is make this understood as a very clear career choice. Um, there's even different types of data leadership. Uh, I haven't gone through all of the, the requisite versions of the podcast, Anthony, but I'm sure you've seen different roles for data leaders to play at different times in their career and as, in organizations' maturities, right? Oh, completely. Yeah, I think I, I, it really, I mean, to me, data leadership is just an adjective on leadership, right? I think leadership is the thing that matters most and data is part of that story versus being a story into itself. And for those of you that are encountering this topic for the first time, there's a wonderful book called Adventures of an IT Leader that's available as an audiobook if you're into that sort of thing or as a, a download from um, Kindle. 
uh, out there. And it describes the process of learning about the profession of being a chief information officer from a participant's perspective. And it's quite good in that. I think we need to invent something like that for our profession, Anthony. And maybe that's a, a project we should talk on, chat on at some other point. That would be, I think, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that the notion of a, a even a career in this space, I think the majority of folks that I've met and, and know in the broader data management community never set out to be data management professionals. They found themselves as one and they're like, oh, hey, there's a community for me. Um, and they really do have a sort of palpable relief at finding us too. It's like, oh, people will <laughs> literally walk into the conferences and go, I've been looking for my family for years and years. <laughs> Completely. But, but our, our, our studies actually, we, we do study this and, and our uh -huh. studies show quite conclusively that most, or, most people spend 10 to 15 years in IT. And over the course of that time, they have bumps on the road and they notice a lot of the bumps are, are, are um, uh, problematic. And, and, observing those bumps over time, they eventually take a step back and say, you know, if somebody would do something about those bumps, they all seem to be data related, um, you know, things would get better. And, and somebody else turns around to them and says, haha, you said the word data, you are now the person in charge of data. <laughs> Literally, it happens that 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 weirdly. Uh, and, and people look around then and find uh, your podcast and other types of resources for data leaders so that they can, can start to look for ways of articulating these things and learning as quickly as we can, because gosh, we've got a lot of books that need to be written in this field. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's one of the things that drew me to this whole notion of data leadership is that too often our relationship with data management, I felt was too passive. It was somebody telling us, hey, this is your job now, go figure it out. And then people would kind of spin their wheels trying to figure out, well, where do I fit into all of this? And and it, it's a reactionary kind of result of a problem that is driven by other challenges in, in change management. And so I think it, taking this kind of leadership view allows us to move to the front of that line and say, hey, we can really help guide where this organization is going strategically as a business and, and, and improve our business outcomes more actively. And, it, and it's an, an attempt, I think, to put data, give data a true seat at the table because, and, and this is something, so maybe this is just a transition that that is inevitable because I am really curious on your thoughts on this relationship between a chief data officer and a chief information officer, because from my vantage point, I feel like, are we just attempting to do the same thing we were attempting to do with the chief information officer in the first place and just failed at it? A weird historical note. I was involved in the drafting of only two laws at the federal level and, and peripherally involved to say the least uh, about it. But one of them was the the uh, law that brought CIOs into the federal government, which, as you alluded to, left us with a, a considerable amount of confusion. And it's right to hope that the enterprise data executive, the chief data officer, the top data job does not end up going out in the same way. But if my screen is showing, you'll see a slide mm -hmm. that I used to talk about this. And, and it's the idea that sometimes the first thing that a data leader has to do in an organization and the most important thing to do is to change the culture. Mm -hmm. Anthony, how many data leaders do you know that are well equipped right now to change the culture of an organization? I am not, I employ professionals to do this when it's time because I would be an idiot if I walked into an organization and said, you need to change your culture and I'm gonna tell you how. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that very few, very few, if any, um, are really equipped to do that at this point. And we don't think about this as a component of it. This isn't to say that all enterprise data executives are going to fail. Um, but there is a pattern that we're seeing where organizations are saying, yeah, I understand this is going to be an interesting um, change for my organization. They may have a strong CIO that, and this goes to your question of, of what's the relationship between there. Um, maybe we should we should bring in a transition CIO uh, to the process. I'm sorry, CDO to the process, so that the organization can you know essentially get mad at somebody and, and sort of blame them and, and give the new individual a clean slate to start with. Because what we are fighting with in all cases is data debt, mm -hmm. and the the way to think about the role 
of the CIO is that they are responsible for production and infrastructure and do generally a very good job of this, partly because we've provided some guidance around them right. uh, and, and said these are the things that CIOs are responsible for. Although, Anthony, that'll take us down another rabbit hole, but I've got a study that we did a couple of years back that says the average CIO is responsible for kind of 20 major things, which gives you you know, maybe 10 minutes a day to think about each of them. Right. And so it was not looking successful if we were going to ask CIOs to do more with data because they would have had to drop some other things. So the the specific reaction I get from CIOs is exactly 50-50 right now. Um, trending in the right direction, but half of the CIOs say, yep, I'm not doing anything with data. I can see it's going to become even more important in the future. Here you go, new individual. Good luck with it. Give me a call if you have any questions. I'm glad that's off my plate. Mm -hmm. The other half of them, of course, are deeply offended and say, "This says chief information officer on my title. What, what, what are you with data here? What, what you're saying that I'm doing a bad job with it?" And the answer is, it aptly sounds like it. Sometimes we say they do a bad job, and we have to be extraordinarily careful about our language because uh, I've I've done talks and I've had people get up and walk out of them thinking that they didn't hear the disclaimer at the very beginning where it says this does not apply to your organization, it applies to another organization I'm talking about. But if you didn't hear that and somebody started criticizing your leadership, yeah, you could you could get upset with this. Yeah. So it, it requires a context and those CIOs generally are able to be brought around by saying you're still responsible for implementation, but the chief data officer is really responsible for the requirement specification around data. Mm -hmm. And if they think of it from that perspective, it becomes a very nice fit. Um, a good organization that has um, actually told some stories in public around that is the uh, Federal Communications Communi uh, Commission. And uh, they have published a couple of uh, short little descriptions of how their CIO and CDO work in a very complementary fashion that is really representative of a best practice uh, and certainly worthy of implementation again. Um, anyway, I think I tried to answer your questions. <laughs> Did I get there? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm that's really interesting because I don't know that I've heard that that comparative before between you know the the kind of lead of understanding the requirements and the implications almost for the business side versus the implementation still residing on the the chief information officer and that that actually i think can fit pretty well because they are somewhat fundamentally different in terms of the forces you exert on the data assets that are involved I think that that line, that delineation may be one of the easier, more clear um, ways of thinking about that when you have both. I think some organizations are still you know, struggling to try to figure out that whole notion of the enterprise data executive and, and do they need something new or is this a, a set of responsibilities that need to be uh, appropriated to an individual who already exists inside the organization. Um, and that may be a good question, actually, is 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 that should somebody in, in you know, seeing the, your leadership in, in any organization that's, you know, says, OK, we have a gap in this space. How do you start to fill that is the right way to say, here, let's appoint somebody, take this on, figure it out. Or is it how, how do they go about doing that? What's the right way there? So let's get at an idea of what the problem is before we try to address the solution uh, around that. And the, the typical thing is something that we call, and I'm going to assume I'm still sharing the screen. It should say <laughs> hidden data factories now. Yep. Good. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, this term comes from Tom Redman, and uh, he published in a Harvard Business article that showed quite conclusively that businesses were losing lots through a practice that we tended to call death by a thousand cuts. The problem is if we label it that, it makes us incredible, not credible as mm -hmm. professionals. I'll get to that. So the hidden data factory, as he describes it, is that department A delivers something to department B and department B makes corrections because they know that department A doesn't do something correct. And so they kind of do that. Well, there's a hidden data factory and then they depart make department B's work and they go around to hang it out to customers. Customers find there's still more errors into it. We come back, there's another hidden data factory around these. And, and when you consider the fact that we know that knowledge workers spend 80% of their time looking for stuff and 20% of the time doing their stuff, this data factory stuff becomes very problematic very quickly. Mm -hmm. And 
the problem is that organizations don't really understand what they're seeing. So they'll see an IT system that doesn't work or a business practice that doesn't work. And while we understand it as commonly the manifestation of bad data, they don't really understand this around the table. And this makes it very difficult for them to articulate and why it's an appropriate metaphor to say death by a thousand cuts. But the problem is your organization isn't dying. So you really have to find a, a polite way of saying you're bleeding excessively from unnecessary cuts. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the most concrete thing you can do with this, Anthony, is to, to take it and put it in terms that everybody understands. And the one that I found that's most powerful right at the moment, because it seems to have happened to a lot of folks, and I can tell you I've encountered it at least 10 times in 2020, uh, was the process where an organization will buy software, say, from uh, salesforce.com, very fine uh, set of services that are there, and turn it on in order to meet some sort of production deadline, but then correct the data in it afterwards. And the reason that's so problematic is because people don't have the, the ability at this level to discern the difference between good software is loaded with bad data and the system sucks. <laughs> and it, it makes it very, very difficult to do this. Now, I'll just finish up here with one other little quick comment, which is that this understanding also needs to be taken into the process, not only of increasing knowledge, worker productivity, but of ethics as well. And so little exercises like having them, you know, having groups read weapons of math destruction and other things or uh, visiting the, the uh, data ethics canvas. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of different components that uh, uh, come into play where people can start to become exposed to these ideas. But it's, it's generally not known outside of the data communities and we need to push this level down into knowledge workers because it's the only way we really have hope of addressing the, the data deluge that's coming at us. And it goes back to data debt in the sense that if we haven't been doing this all along, then starting it now is gonna require us to clean some things before we start to really improve some things. And, and that elimination of data debt has to be the first set of opportunities that the organizations evaluate uh, when, when considering investing additional resources into this. So I think, so, so to oversimplify and paraphrase, it almost sounds like if we start a conversation by saying, okay, how do we create a chief data officer or enterprise data executive? We may not be thinking about this in as logical of a form as if we said, how do we build appropriate data literacy and build the capabilities that we'll need and then figure out from there what elect executive leadership do we need to support that? Is that a fair summation? getting towards it but really we find in many organizations it's a tough sell mm -hmm. so you have the choice basically of an executive that is unfamiliar with the general subject material that we talk about in data and you're asking them to make an investment decision and they have a choice of checking a box and saying buy tableau that will solve all your problems which again i'm not picking on tableau but mm -hmm. lots of organizations and lots of, of uh, products will say that they will solve all your problems generally of course the answer is they'll solve some of your problems but uh, finding all of them is a, is a more difficult approach to it and, and then saying to them, no, you actually need to approach it more of something like a 12-step uh, process. Mm -hmm. And this is where I get, you know, some nodding heads around the table and saying, okay, that's a, a substantively different discussion than it is to, to talk about, you know, taking a, a smidgen of time and devoting it into something like we did the Six Sigma efforts or the TQM efforts of the past. Uh, it's, it's really a very different approach to this. Uh, and if you're not familiar with 12-step effort, it just represents a a sustainable commitment uh, uh, of uh, making a life life focusing change. And that's, you know, closer to what we'd like people to think about in terms of getting serious about data than, than necessarily just sort of saying, okay, I can buy a, a technology and that'll be the end of it. Right. And I think most of the folks listening to this probably have more than a handful of stories of times where you know, they've been involved with a technology purchase that didn't meet its expectations, um, often uh, wildly uh, overstated expectations in, in an organization in a number of capacities. And so I guess then the question is, I mean, is this something then where the best advice for uh, 
you know, improving our data competencies in organizations? Is it something that we should start in a um, more narrow band of an organization and try to get it right there? Or is this something that we need to kind of grow across the board um, little by little? Like, it, it just, is there something to be said for starting small in a specific area? Or is this something that has to be systemic across the organization from the start? It depends on where the organization is in its journey. In many organizations, we're finding that they're trying to get to digital, that this has become an inspirational message. And, and truly, you know, many of us would love to, to in interact with the various other organizations in a, in a truly digital fashion, but they're trying to do digital without doing data. And I just want to share with you an insight that this is the way this community works. Uh, our colleague, Mark Johnson, sort of was doodling one day and, and came up with this. And he says, well, if you subtract data from digital, I'm not sure what it leaves you with. But I know that if you subtract digital from data, it definitely leaves you with the data. Mm. And the, the challenge is that organizations don't realize that when they look at this, and GIGO stands for garbage in and garbage out, that you know they can take a lot of money and come up with a perfect model. But of course, if you fill it with garbage data, you will get garbage results. And that's true whether your solution is a warehouse or machine learning or business intelligence or blockchain or AI or, I mean, the list goes on and on and right. on. And this fundamental lesson of where should we be applying leverage becomes obvious when we look at the kinds of things that can be achieved by harmonizing data flows and applying the same types of data quality programs, not repeatedly over and over again, but at one place and in, in, in managing data from a more centralized location, then and only then do we have real proof of the ability to, to turn this from something that's problematic into something that's actually quite a bit more useful. It's, it's funny. I, I was, I, as you were talking, I, I kind of laughed at myself. I'm like, it always comes back to data quality. It always comes back to data quality is, is, and, and that it, I think that's I mean, that's that's really what it, it does come back to is, is, you know, all of these intermediary steps, I think, are best aligned or, or, or the success is best measured in terms of data quality, because that becomes the critical path to those good results. Like the, the middle ground there, there's a lot of options. There's a lot of roads that lead from place A to place B and if you don't have quality data to begin with, you'll never get to place B. Absolutely. And just as a, a quick aside, but I know that you love recommendations. Danette McGilvery is working on a wonderful new data quality book that would be a tremendous uh, insight for your audience to hear her speak about. So I'll just put in a quick plug for her on that one. Definitely. And I have been begging Danette to join the, the podcast. Um, so we will we're going to get Danette, everybody. Um, it may not be immediately, but we'll, 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 we will get her on this show at, at some point soon, hopefully. So um, hopefully uh, Danette will hear this and say, fine, fine, Anthony, I'll, I'll, I'll do it now. So <laughs> Sorry, thank Danette. you, Peter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> She's terrific. Yeah. Oh, Danette's one of my favorite people. So um, I do want to spend a little bit of time because, because this goes back to uh, what I spoke with uh, John Ladley about a few weeks ago. And, and, and this, I think, too, kind of ties into what we were just talking about or is, is around this notion of, of data monetization. And I think a lot of organizations out there have this awareness now that their data is valuable. <laughs> there is something to this data thing. And they like dollars and they want some of they want some more of the dollars and you know i'm, I'm oversimplifying uh to mostly entertain myself i think but it's it's uh you know how how do these organizations especially when we think about like we're having trouble leveraging data just to function as good as we can if we start to think about data monetization does that actually complicate it further or is it does it simplify and help us get towards some of these things that we're talking about with these fundamentals of data that are so important to our businesses? So a couple of quick things that are, are worth talking about. And, and the first one is really to understand that the, organi the, the organizational reliance on data is continuing to increase. And our ability to analyze the data that we have is not increasing. Even though we have nice programs that talk about data science and, and other types of things, um, it's not, <clears throat> excuse me, addressing even close to what we need to get to 
to really understand the totality of the data that's out there. And that's confounded by an equally insidious problem that four-fifths, minimally, I guarantee you, of the data in your organization falls into the category of redundant, obsolete, or trivial data. Mm. And that means it gets in the way and it, it puts a break on things that you're actually trying to achieve. Uh, if we consider the internet running at about 40% uh, you know, malware going through all of the bits and pieces that are out there, uh, data quality problems in organizations probably are double that. Uh, just to start with and that just imagine how much harder the heart has to pump to get blood through the veins if they're 80 percent of the way clogged with stuff that just doesn't doesn't need to be there um the, the the kinds of things i think that organizations need to think about from a monetization perspective is that first of all the shoot for the stars real uberization of a field and remember we're using this word Uberization, Anthony, to, to really represent something that does not exist, which is that Uber, while it may have fundamentally changed the way in which Uber works, Uber has not changed the economics mm -hmm. of the way in which this works. If Uber were to stop subsidizing at this point in time the rides that, that people take, it would be very quickly close to, to back approaching what the old taxi rate used to be. So when we call something Uberized, we have to be careful and decide whether we really want to favor them with that sort of an approach. But but nevertheless, that, that breakthrough idea, the real innovation, is a rarer commodity than is the savings-based innovation. And, and so, first of all, organizations need to recognize that they need to balance between the two types. If you go all out for the big picture, you're going to miss it nine times out of ten. And the question is, can you afford to do that? Mm. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing if you're set up to do it. There's a, a very convincing case made that's it is problematic for major investments by our friend Amy Webb, who wrote a book called The Big Nine. It says basically anything that's done outside of these nine specific identified companies, um, it's a toy and it's not ever going to achieve any of the volume that needs to happen in order to, to be of use in today's environment. So so getting realistic about the monetization effects is, is critically important. And I, I just go to one sort of general slide that I use to, to guide these um, without diving in too far. But looking at knowledge worker productivity is, again, still our best approach to this, which is just removing one click from a repetitive process. Uh, my class did an analysis for a, a charity last year that one of the findings was you had to click seven times in order to find the donate button for the first time. You know, if your mission is to achieve donations, seven times seems like an unnecessary number of clicks uh, in there. And then, then start tallying these clips and finding out what it is that's, that's taking time around this, but that you can then put a, at least a minimum number of cost on the uh, opinion. And it may be small, like a penny a time, but if it happens a billion times a day, these pennies, add up into something that's a little bit more productive around that. Mm. Is that helpful? Yeah. Well, and, and uh, that I think is the kind of thing that we have to be thinking about constantly is, is how do we do something tangible and it can be a small thing. It could be removing one or two clicks from that process. And that's going to lead us to some really meaningful things when we aggregate the, like in that case, billions of times people are clicking that can lead to some real meaningful outputs from a very small input. And anytime we can get leverage by the actions that we take, that's a set of actions worth considering, right? So as data leaders, one of the things I would urge everybody to consider putting in their data governance charter is the ability to do, to initiate, to, to start, to sponsor even and, and obtain the benefits from as well credit for the benefits from uh, the ability to do business process re-engineering type of activities whether you want to take a, a six sigma approach or any number of very good approaches to helping organizations do more with what they currently have um, that will be seen as, as something that was within the mission of data governance because data governors do have the best information about what's going on in the organization and that leads to these improvements in a very very meaningful fashion so that's a, a very small but concrete step and if we start to say that it pretty soon it will become a best practice and then soon after that it will become standard yeah, I mean, I think I, I I think you're right on. And and while we still have a couple of of moments um, to talk before we have to wrap up, um, I'd like to understand. Um, you know, you've you've been uh, you know 
known for uh, your organization Data Blueprint for many years, um, but you now have a new organization uh, called Anything Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so Data Blueprint lasted about 20 years. We got hit by COVID, which was an un unfortunate occurrence. Um, I had actually transferred a controlling interest to a group of employees. So we'll say that they had the, the specifics around the challenge, but we're in the process of cleaning that up. And the idea is with anything awesome, we have actually the opportunity for these wonderful private public partnerships that are starting to appear and, and become more and more common. Anthony, let me just ask you to evaluate two different headlines that you might see in the newspaper. Um, State X, depend on whatever it is, uh, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles uh, is caught making hundreds, tens of millions of dollars selling data to uh, insurance companies. That doesn't sound like a very good headline. Your boss would be pretty upset if you see that, right? Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> so another headline describing the same events in an equally productive fashion could be uh, uh, Department X at State Y uh, saves taxpayers X number of tens of millions of dollars legally uh, uh, exchanging cash for data in a series of things designed to save taxpayers uh, the ability to have to pay. So like the Alaskan oil dividend, this, this data stuff could actually become quite valuable. Hmm. Sound a little better? Well, yes. I mean, and, and it's obviously, I mean, it's saying the same fundamental thing. And I well, think- one hopes that the people of the, whatever state it was did follow the law in order to do this. <laughs> but it, it describes two ways you could describe a possible scenario. And it requires us to become a little more literate about the topic that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. I think it, and it, it highlights both an opportunity and a danger of the use and monetization of, of data is that, you know, data and the interpretation of data can easily be manipulated uh, both due to unintentional and intentional uh, bias and, and subjectivity. And, and I think this this highlights it in an innocuous way. But it's it's something that is there um, almost like every time we're working with data at all is is what subjectivity is entering into the equation here. Well, and let's let's take it even further than that. I, I love big abstractions. So, what business challenge is not inherently a data challenge? And I have yet in thirty five years of finding an example where that would not be correct. So. Mm. If one starts to take that approach to it, a data first, a data centric, whatever it is that we're going to call this new way of thinking about it, uh, then we need to have some ideas of A, what do we mean by data centric, but but B, if we're going to go in that direction, what does this mean for the organizations that we're working with? What is, how is this going to transfer them? Where can we get the greatest leverage uh, for the efforts that we're going to put in? Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's a... That's a, an almost a jumping off point for the next time we have you on, because we are just about out of time uh, today. And uh, man, we, we haven't even I, I knew, uh, Peter, in, in talking with you today, I knew we would scratch the surface of, of the amount of things we could talk about. We didn't even do that. I feel like I just like blemished the surface. We didn't even scratch, like we didn't even get started in our conversation today. There's so much I want to do this. We were definitely going to need to create a series around some of these topics and dive much deeper into it because there's so much every time I, I often joked, it's like every time you're working with data, you know, you're turning over stones, right? You're turning over stones and you're seeing what's under them. And every time you turn over a stone, what you see is worse than you were hoping and then there's also a hundred more stones and like, that's, that's how it feels like there's so much to, to, to turn over. But, um, you know, in the, in the last moment that we have, you know, what, what one thing could you say to folks that are like, just overwhelmed with some of the topics that we've talked about today? Cause each one of them is a tough challenge. This stuff's not easy. What, what words of advice would you have for these folks that are just trying to get their foothold? Some of those folks that we we've met at the conferences before that are, are, you know, new to these roles, new to trying to do more with data and just overwhelmed by it all. Cause we definitely did not help that today. <laughs> well, there, there's actually a most productive path that you can use to approach these challenges with. And the first is to recognize 
the idea that there is data debt and that you deal with data debt differently than you do when you're creating new capabilities. And those are, are distinct skills and you need to make sure that you've got the ability to, to deal with one and then the other in, in a sequence. Uh, by the way, learn from your data debt as well because the things that are wrong with your data debt are going to be important to informing your new system design. That is the essence of, of going in, in this reverse engineering. But when, beyond that, we have been doing too little data education in the world and we need to do a considerable amount more and that the area that we can start to do this with is in fact a data literacy test of our new employees that are coming in and other things being equal selecting those employees that exhibit the highest amounts of data literacy in there uh, in order to come up with with uh, improvements to the workforce because that's the level of granularity we now need to change uh, focuses to the big big new ideas have been done and they will still come on a periodic basis, but the regular productivity is going to be improved at a much lower level of granularity. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a, a good bit of advice and something that folks can take some comfort in understanding and realizing that too. You know, the big problems don't get solved in one day. Things are, are, you know, we work at it, we get better, we learn from it, and we repeat. And there are some really interesting, um, you know, cycles to that and, and things that you've explored and, and the work that you've done. So hopefully we'll have you on again very soon and we'll keep talking about these things because I think that your perspective and ability to make some of these connections or even just something like that, that chief data officer and chief information officer and how those roles might compare. I think that's something that is um, you know really insightful, something that's very helpful as we try to think about all these complexities and we'll, we'll continue to talk and, and peel back that onion, as it were, for for folks that are, are trying to learn these things and, and understanding them. So, Peter- well, To be very clear, I did not invent that particular piece that was contributed by a member of our profession. And that's what we're looking to do is to have others contribute these experiences and, and through podcasts such as this, uh, to make everybody smarter in the, the fastest way possible so we can avoid some of the previous traps. So thank you for what you're doing in this area, Anthony. I appreciate it. And, and I feel like, and, and, I, and I know this in, in talking with you, it's like the amount Amount of gratitude we feel for those that we've learned from, and you know the, you know, it, it's it's awesome to have what little piece we can in you know furthering that conversation. But I think it just comes from us making these connections and talking about these things and learning from the connections that others have made and and the and the parallels. I mean, you brought up several during this uh, conversation that you know people have had these great ideas and we want to share them and we want to learn from them and we want to build upon them to help make these really difficult things just a little bit easier. So Peter, thank you so much for being on the show and for all the work you've done in the space. And we didn't even get to talk about Dama and talk about so many things. So please uh, come back again soon and 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 we'll um, we'll have a lot more to talk about. So thank you again. I look forward to it. And Thanks, thank Anthony. You, thank you. And thank you all for watching or listening today. In the show notes, you'll find useful links and more information about today's topic. Follow Data Leadership Lessons on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Check out my book at dataleadershipbook.com and use promo code AlgmanDL at the Dataversity Training Center for 20% off your first purchase. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact. <laughs>